Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a deed of power in my name will be able soon after to speak evil of me. Whoever is not against us is for us. For truly I tell you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you bear the name of Christ will by no means lose the reward. If any of you put a stumbling block before one of these little ones who believe in me, it would be better for you if a great millstone were hung around your neck and you were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life maimed than to have two hands and go to hell to the unquenchable fire. If your foot, foot causes you to stumble, cut it off. It's better for you to enter life lame than to have two feet and be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to stumble, tear it out. It's better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than to have two eyes and be thrown into hell, where their worm never dies and the fire is never quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if salt has lost its saltiness, how can you season it? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. You may be seated. And for the biblical literalists present with us this morning, bone saws and eye gouging spoons will be available in the narthex at the end of the service today. <laughs> Well, just had to mention, this is a rather strange text, isn't it? But as I was reading it, the word that jumped out to me from these lessons today was tattletales. You heard it read just a minute ago, and then you heard it again in the gospel. Tattletales. We're all familiar with them because we've all been tattletales. Mama, mama, Billy's doing something he isn't supposed to. Except in this case, the disciples are the ones who are running to Jesus to tattle. They tell him, teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name. <laughs> we tried to stop him because he wasn't one of us. And only we get to use your name, right, Jesus? We're your disciples, not him. Right, Jesus? But Jesus will have none of that. He says, kids, I, I mean, my disciples, you mean to tell me that, that someone was doing something good in my name and you tried to stop them? <laughs> what are you thinking? They want him to, to stop this other man, to fix his behavior. And instead, Jesus turns his gaze on them. And Jesus indicates that anyone who is doing something good for others, especially someone who is healing, bringing life to people who are sick or hurting, that person is doing a good and godly thing. It's pleasing to God. So don't stop him. Help him. Even a small kindness like a, a cup of water for someone who is thirsty is a godly action. Whoever does it. But, but Jesus, I mean, that's not right. He's using your name, and, and he's not one of us. And I can just see Jesus shaking his head in disbelief. Or, or maybe not, because he does know us very well. Instead of responding to their request to go stop this other guy, to correct him, to, to firmly inform this man that he shouldn't be out healing people because he wasn't a member, Jesus turns his focus back on them. He says, yes, it is proper to be concerned about behavior that doesn't belong, to be serious and intentional about sin, but not other people's, your own. And I'm reminded of another quote from Jesus when he said, why do you work so hard to point out the speck in your neighbor's eye, yet fail to see the log in your own eye? First take the log out of your own eye, then maybe you can see clearly enough to help the other person. 
In other words, deal with your own stuff before you go judging others, even if you think you're helping. And of course, dealing with our own stuff will take a lifetime, so I guess we'll never really get around to pointing out the specks in our neighbor's eyes, huh? Honestly, all of us, we stand so ready to correct other people, to stop their bad behavior, you know, to help them be better people. If they'll just listen to us and behave like we think they should and, and believe like we think they should believe and act in the way we think they should act, like well, the world would be a better place, right? And Jesus says, basically, get over yourself. He says, I'm the one who has come to show the path to life. I'm the only one who gets to judge, not you. If you really want this world to be a better place, begin the examination by looking in the mirror. Look at your own stuff, your own sin, and get radical about your own issues first. And he does seem to get pretty radical in this text, kind of borrow, borrowing some of the Pharisees' language. So what is it that gets in the way of our following Jesus faithfully, passionately, with real dedication? That's what we hear Jesus rather firmly calling our attention to. What is it in your life and mine that, that distracts us from being dedicated followers of Jesus? What is it that, that draws you away from God? Fear, busyness, apathy, greed, constant need for control, a hatred of others, a hatred of self, self-indulgent. What is my own sin? And what do you need to fix in you? Let that be our passion, not, not fixing other people. <laughs> and the thing is, even when we decide to, to work on ourselves, we most often fail. And that simple fact should keep us both humble and hungry for the gift of God's love and mercy. In those moments when we realize we are not what God intended us to be, and yet God still loves us dearly, those can be the most powerful moments of all. Humbled and grace-filled. Now the other thing about this text, as, as the disciples start talking in this language about, he's not one of us, Jesus warns them about placing stumbling blocks in front of others. And this all had me wondering, as Christians, at times, does our passion for our own beliefs, or maybe more honestly, our fear of those who are different from us, does it place a stumbling block in front of people of other faiths? A stumbling block that makes it harder for them to experience the love of God through us. If so, what should our response be to those who believe in a faith different from our own or who have no faith? In this case, Jesus says, don't stop someone who is doing good, even if they're not a Christian. Don't refuse the help of someone, even if you don't know whether they believe. And don't place stumbling blocks in the way of anyone who is in need or vulnerable. And he concludes it all by saying, be at peace with one another. Perhaps he's pointing out to us that acting respectfully toward those who are not one of us is something that can lead to God's peace in this world. Along these lines, I'm reminded of something one of my professors from Wartburg Seminary said years ago, and it stuck with me all along. It was a warning he issued about our tendency to, to judge who's in and who's out in those games that we play. Dr. Preeby said, every time you draw a line between who's in and who's out, 
you're going to find Jesus on the other side. Here's the thing. Our communities and our world are only getting more pluralistic, more complex, more diverse. And that means we're more and more likely to meet and get to know people of different faiths or no faith. In the workplace, the neighborhood, school, the PTA, you name it. So perhaps this week's reading provides a good opportunity to reflect on our Christian responsibility to those who believe differently. Are we being the love of God for them? Or are we putting stumbling blocks in their path to faith with our behaviors? Stumbling blocks, roadblocks to faith. In this rather strange passage in Mark's Gospel, Jesus confronts his disciples, including us, challenging us to rethink things. What is it that's become such a consumer of my time and energy that my relationship with Jesus has been pushed aside? What is my own sin that keeps me from being the loving person God designed me to be? How do I treat people who aren't one of us? Am I a stumbling block for others? For myself? These are the questions Jesus draws our attention to. He tells his disciples, rather than trying to fix other people, focus on being the person God is calling you to be. And that's really where our focus always needs to be, on God and God's amazing love for us, for all people. Christianity is not about our right behavior and other people's wrong. It's not about who's in and who's out. It's about that grandest of stories, about a God who loves us and wants our life to be all that it was designed to be. It's about letting the love of God that we have experienced be seen in us and flow through us. The disciples were all in an uproar about an outsider who was doing something they thought was going to make Jesus mad. Instead, Jesus was pleased that the outsider was doing good. And he treats the man like an insider. And then he gives the disciples he loves some rather firm instructions. Don't be so ready to point out the problems of others. Concentrate on your own issues. It will both humble you and open you to the wonders of God's grace for you, for others, and for the whole world. May the love of God free us and ever lead us into God's peace. And to God be the glory. Amen.